All right, we are back with Hunter Albright from um, Curb 10 and also from CU Boulder, faculty member at the Leeds School of Business. Um, Hunter, thanks so much for joining us again to talk about developing disruptive ideas today. Oh, my pleasure to be here. Awesome. Well, this talk is about making ideas insanely disruptive. So can you just start off by telling us a little bit about why it's so hard to come up with a truly disruptive idea in the first place? You know, I, I think fundamentally the biggest challenge is that we limit ourselves, right? I mean, we don't really allow ourselves the, the space and the freedom to push ideas uh, to the extreme because we, we just put self-imposed constraints. It might be because we're worried about how implementable they might be. We're worried about sort of our ability to execute them. But in general, I would say people just don't take the, you know, amp it up enough in terms of the, how far they take it. I think the other thing we tend to do and people tend to do as groups is they add too much into a product. And so therefore you're trying to do too many things and you're not going to be good at any one of them. Um, and so for me, those are the two most common things that I see uh, in terms of how we don't allow ourselves to sort of, I guess, realize the potential of some of the creative thinking that we can apply. That's really interesting because it's like you're taking, you're putting too many constraints on yourself, but you're not putting enough constraints on the product. It's a kind of an interesting sort of tension there. No, Zach, I think that's a, it's a really great point. In many respects, the more you put constraints on the problem or the audience or sort of, let's call it the impact that you want to have, it forces you to then dive deeper in a more limited number of dimensions in mm -hmm. order to find something that will be disruptive. That's what um, it means. You know, and I think it's really applicable to how we think about sort of blockchain and distributed ledger innovation in general. I don't think people have to be solving all of the problems at one time. You know, in many respects, the more sort of myopic we can get in terms of innovating in really specific areas, we'll get to really dramatically different situations uh, and, and surprise ourselves. That uh, there is, um, I don't know if you guys, do you guys know the band OK Go? Have you heard of oh, that? Yeah. Right? So they've got a great TED Talk, which we should provide a link where they really talk about, they don't invent or they don't, you know, they talk about how they find their ideas by creating sandboxes in which they play. And they typically pick one or two dimensions in which they just will completely experiment and play before they ever get to trying out an idea. And I just think that's such a fantastic mindset because when we think about how it, when innovation works really well, we go off and we just try shit. You know, we play in a sandbox, we see how far we can push it, and then we come back and we try to reassemble those parts into a way that we can create an application for a very specific user group. Uh, so it's one, it's their, the videos are fun to watch, the TED Talk's fun to watch, but I, I think there are a lot of great lessons in there for how we should think about blockchain innovation. I love that. I'm, uh, I, I'm definitely going to include that in the, uh, in the description <laughs> below. That's fantastic. So, I mean, knowing that it's kind of a, a field battle, right? Like that you're kind of fighting with the tension both to add and to sub subtract. Like, how would you recommend freeing ourselves up to challenge the, stat the status quo? Yeah, I, th I generally talk to people about this in sort of five or six different sort of concepts to try to think about. It. I think the first one is go big, right? Don't go well beyond incremental. Try to sort of see how far, how radically different you can be for a certain use case and push your ideas to the extreme. Uh, I think the second one is see how hyper-focused you can get on an audience. The, the more tight your audience is, the more clearly you understand who you're trying to serve. You know, if you're trying to serve everybody, you're gonna serve nobody. So it's better off sort of really going deep and saying, I'm going to really try to solve this specific use case for this specific group. Gives you those constraints that we were talking about. Uh, you know, I think uh, we also then really need to be thinking about of, your pro of all the things you can put in your product, you know, I tend to sort of think about it almost like a spider diagram where you're just going to take one dimension and you're really going to sort of sort of 10 exit and sort of stretch it out as opposed to having all of them sort of, you know, go out. I mean, you'll compromise on some and give up on some of the, you know, it might be the speed, it might be the usability, depending on really what you want to try to sort of uh, have what 
excuse me, what you really want your idea to stand, how you want your idea to stand apart. Uh, and that's where I think then there's really thinking about that dimension of disruption, pick one or two things, but no more, and then really try to sort of go as extreme as you can on those. Uh, and I think that, you know, if you've done that and you really think about uh, those elements, then you will be able to start to drive disruption uh, in terms of having something that is not incrementally better, it's radically different uh, than what else is out there. Yeah, I think it's incredible to think about like taking something to the extreme as a constraint, right? Like, so we talked about constraints kind of limiting the problem in a good way, actually, in some cases and in bad ways in other cases, but by constraining yourself to be completely disruptive on one or two axes, as you've indicated, you're laying groundwork for kind of, or like, okay, go, you know, as you mentioned, you're kind of laying groundwork for where you can play and you're adding constraints, even though those constraints are crazy compared to kind of traditional constraints in the industry. So I think that's a cool way to, to reframe um, constraining ourselves by forcing disruption to be part of the equation. Yeah, I mean, and you know, I, again, it goes back, we talked about sort of how we generally limit ourselves. If we're trying to juggle or include three or four things, five things into a product, we don't get as focused, we're not as creative as sort of in the one area, uh, you know, so I think, you know, trying to develop almost one dimensional products uh, is really sort of interesting to see how good you can make it. And then maybe somebody else has done it with another, taking another dimension. And that's where we're going to end up with really great collaboration in terms of, Hey, Katie, you've done a great user interface in terms of how to take, you know, something down to just two or three steps uh, in terms of, you know, logging in and, and making a transaction and somebody else has solved the, the sort of speed of transaction and we're able to bring them together and make a better sort of total use case as opposed to one person basically compromising on both and, and getting stuck in the middle. Yeah, absolutely. So because Zach and I are facilitators and we part of our job is to kind of help people get through some of these kinds of frameworks and stuff like that, I assume that you you have some kind of frameworks or tools or resources that you'd recommend using to kind of prime the pump for some of this innovative thinking. Um, can you share those with us, even if it's just kind of at a high level, what what they would look like? Yeah, no, I you know for for a lot of these, we in fact I'll share some templates that we can include uh, below the video to help. I think it you know help people land their ideas and refine their ideas. I think it's really important to do that, and I think especially within sort of hackathons where people are coming together as a team, potentially for the first time, it's a great way to get everybody organized and on the same page about where you really want to focus. And over the course of 15 days, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, how do you really develop something that is as disruptive as possible? Uh, and I think really one talking about it and making some choices of what's in and what's out uh, can be really helpful. So I'm happy to share those uh, those templates and hopefully people will find it helpful as a guide as they get started. That sounds fantastic. Um, I'm, I can't wait to actually like see those templates. They sound <laughs> amazing. I, I think the next question that I would, I would have kind of, kind of naturally leads into this is like, could you give some examples of businesses that upended traditional thinking? I'm sorry. What was that Zach? Could you give examples of businesses that upended traditional thinking? Like what businesses have been started kind of using this methodology? Oh, in terms of ra sort of radical disruption? Well, I mean, I think Bitcoin is, is probably a great one, right? I mean, it sort of completely turned on its head in terms of in, when it was sort of first launched. I think that we've seen, you know, nobody thought that sort of Twitter would work. Nobody thought that sort of Uber and, and sort of Airbnb would work. They were completely... So actually, this is a really good point. They were completely different models of operating that were applied to an existing problem. And so one of the things that I see and I think is generally talked about is we're trying to take sort of today's solutions and just integrating blockchain. And we're not sort of completely rethinking the approach to how we can invent a new model of operating for solving a new problem. And so, um, you know, I think there's been, you know, one of sort of a example is people talk about building. And so when steel was first invented, I think it was 10 to 20 years, you know, they started applying steel to build one and two story and three story buildings, which are perfectly 
fine building being built out of brick, you know, and it will, but it wasn't until sort of many years later, people started to say, oh, you know, we can build a hundred stories or 50 stories and dramatically change how we think about it. I think if we can learn from some of that uh, in the past and start straight away thinking about, you know, how do we not recreate sort of the three-story office building, but rather like, how far could I push it in terms of a completely new building uh, when we think about sort of the blockchain applications that will get to a better spot. And I think in particular, you know, I know I was super excited when you guys first talked about credit scoring and financial mm -hmm. applications, because I think that's an industry generally, a lot of those solutions haven't been sort of reinvented in many respects for over 50 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the opportunity now to maybe not necessarily develop a new technology, but take a lot of technologies that are already out there to create a brand new way of doing, for example, credit scoring, you know, combining sort of some of the mathematical solutions that are out there, the use of social media in terms of monitoring whether somebody's trustworthy or not based on what they say and who they associate with, combined with sort of all of the different elements uh, that could be brought in sort of on the, the blockchain and the cryptocurrency side in terms of how people might get micro loans to start with and build up their their credit and their transactions. I think it's a it's a fantastic or fascinating space to be in. Yeah, and it's worth noting that we're actually doing a separate video on why finance is particularly exciting with Hunter as well. So definitely check that out um, on our YouTube channel because that's going to be a specific deep dive into why we think finance is kind of the beginning of a lot of the other industries taking um, taking flight from, from some of the Web3 and blockchain stuff. I love that you talked a little bit about Airbnb and Uber because I think they're good to, and the steel example as well, I think it's good to look at how, you know, in Airbnb's case, for example, upending an orthodoxy that no one would want to stay in a stranger's house, um, led a tiny company to become the single largest hotel chain um, on the planet, right? And it's just, if you're thinking broadly outside the box about just how disruptive can we be, you know, um, you're not saying how can Marriott be better than Hilton or how can, um, how can I make my, you know, mom and pop Airbnb one shop be better than a Hilton, right? Like you're saying, yep. how can we leverage all the homes in the world that aren't being used the way that they could be being used to provide lodging for people who need it? And I, I think that's right. But I also don't, we shouldn't lose the sight that they were super focused on what they were solving at the very first place. So the very first application of Airbnb was to provide extra beds and a little bit of a local experience for people that were going to San Francisco for a design conference. And so it was a super micro test that they were willing to sort of, hey, let's try this wild and crazy idea. Um, they were thinking about sort of Airbnb, what it is today and how to leverage all the homes. They did that one incremental or sort of that one disruptive innovation in one dimension that then they got help from others to figure out how to scale it. And so I think that's a really good mindset for us to think about how do we pick the one dimension, take it to the extreme, innovate it on it in a in sort of, you know, how can we get something out there as quick as possible uh, in, in sort of really think about being agile in the testing and, and the experimentation related to the applications. And then let's get the community help to, and, and build it out from there. Yeah, I think what's worth also mentioning, I completely agree, and I loved your reframe of kind of the early stage Airbnb goals, but also, you know, they were based on, they were experimenting in one dimension, right? But they were also based on solid needs on both sides of their dual side yep. of the marketplace. They have people in San Francisco who could barely make rent and needed to kind of get some extra cash income to pay for their really expensive lodging in, in downtown San Francisco. And they had people who could barely afford to come to San Francisco to go to a conference couldn't afford to stay at a hotel, didn't want to crash on a friend's couch, um, needing a place to stay for cheap, right? So um, again, serving based on serving user needs and having a very specific use case and then experimenting in one dimension of complete, um, just disruptive innovation. So kind of a cool combo there and really well, worth looking at. Um, yeah. How do you think that that translates over to Web3 where I feel like Web3 naturally has so much disruption in it? Like how do you kind of play with experimenting in one dimension, as you call it, when Web3 itself feels so disruptive to begin with? No, I think that, well, so I, I think it's a really good point. I think part of it is 
figuring out how to isolate it so you can sort of try to go deeper in testing one thing in terms of, you know, it's either the use case uh, or it's going to be some of the technology and the usability and sort of the experience of people on it. Uh, I think that in many respects, you know, we, for me, if we can really figure out how to drive the value of uh, and innovate around making transactions easier about having those take place between two people and have that be as simple as possible, then that will really open a lot of doors for more users coming in. Because one of the things that we're lacking for a lot of the validation in the Web3 sort of um, experiments, if you will, is just more people trying them out and, and sort of more usage and greater volume uh, of both experiments as well as people that are trying trying those out and I think if we figure out how to sort of do that on the transaction side and a little bit of what we talked about earlier on the use case side that will give us a little bit of the volume of, of users and momentum that we need to start to go deeper and solve some of the other problems I love that so I think I mean we're kind of at the end of our time I think like one last question would be like are there any parting thoughts like as someone like well, let's say that these are technologists who are entering this space right like what is just like the the 80 20 high level like the, the core of what you're what you're trying to get them to, to start thinking about when they start thinking about completely upturning these sort of these sort of construct constructs and ideas yeah I, you know the is is one dimension at a time right so find a use case and try and see go around and build well a couple things one to say one dimension at a time Go, you know, and work with your team, get it on paper and do lots of different versions about thinking about it and then pick the one you're most passionate about that you really think will be, you'll be proud of whether it, it, it succeeds, but at least that you've tried uh, and then you feel like it has the biggest opportunity to make an impact. And that may be value, that may be people, that may be, you know, however you want to define it. But I think if we can get more people being passionate about making an impact uh, in whatever area they want um, and trying to be as focused on it as they can, uh, that, that, that it will be infectious, that they'll make progress, but they will inspire others to make progress as well. I love that. Uh, we're gonna, I may, I may type that up as like a headliner tweet for whatever we're promoting this, because I think that's fantastic. Hunter, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we're gonna go ahead.